when I was a really active, uh, dogmatic, you know, uh, eager, keen Christian uh, back in the day, I, I remember coming across this idea while I was searching online. We're, so we're talking about the, the mid to late noughties. And I remember searching online, I was desperate for, for, for teaching, for, for getting deeper into the scriptures and so on. And I remember coming across the idea of universal salvation here and there, universal reconciliation. And I remember being frankly terrified and disgusted at this idea, <laughs> um, which is funny, I, you know, when I reflect back on it now, it's a bit weird. Why would I be terrified and, and horrified by this idea when it's on the face of it, an amazing idea that you know everybody will eventually be saved uh but um you know i turned away from it and i didn't look at it again and here i am again after many 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 years of not really being uh you know actively christian or involved in religion or whatever and i'm looking back again at this idea of universal reconciliation and and it's a fascinating one now basically it, now when i'm reading the bible i have no axe to grind i've got no doctrines that I need to protect I've got no kind of uh, you know ideology to protect I've got no even with regard to my view of the actual Bible itself I have no uh, no doctrine of biblical inerrancy or you know I, I'm, I'm open to everything if the Bible if different texts contradict themselves I'm open to that if even the same text or the same letters contradict themselves I'm open to that if different people uh, had different views to other people in the Bible, say Paul and James had different views. I'm open to that and it's not a problem for me. Uh, so I'm going back and I'm looking at this idea of universal reconciliation. And when I, what I've been doing, I've, I've been focusing on Paul. I've been reading around, looking what people say about Paul's views of re universal reconciliation. And in this video, what I'd like to do is to read some of the uh, places where it does seem that Paul of Tarsus really did believe that everybody ultimately would would be has been and would would be uh, saved by the messiah yeshua so one of the first places one of the most clear places really is uh, is colossians and this is uh, this is colossians 1 chapter 1 i've got on screen here and i'm going to read uh, read from uh, verse uh, let's have a look i'll read from verse 15 really just to keep things you know not too long-winded this is, to, this is a famous passage, really, because it's one of the passages that people use to prove that Yeshua is God, that Yeshua is pre-existent, that Yeshua created everything, that he is God. And that was really one of the battleground scriptures that I, that I used to have when I was trying to argue against that view and argue for, Trinit for Unitarianism. But actually, this is also a very important uh, writing from Paul with regard to the scope of of salvation and the scope of atonement. So let's have a look. It says, he, that's talking about Yeshua, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the, the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was, was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of the cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body by flesh, uh, body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So there's so much in there, but the, to just kind of pin, down, pin it down just on this topic, the key thing here really that advocates of universal uh, reconciliation point to is the all. And what I want you to do is to think about it. I remember I remember looking at this verse, this, this passage with regard to the whole Jesus being God thing and focusing on the all, all by all by him, all things were created, this, that and the other. And that's what people look at. And it is true. When you look through this whole passage at the alls, it is all-encompassing and the, the argument is that 
it, it's all the way through that we should we should view all as meaning all. So, for example, he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation, i.e., no other thing that has been created came before him. For by him, all things were created. Again, he made all things. All things. The idea is he made everything. Paul is see, seems to be trying to make it clear that that everything was made through Yeshua. Everything was made through Mashiach. Everything in heaven, everything on earth. He's trying to f find the most expansive language impossible, uh, uh, the most expansive language possible to get across the fact that every single thing in creation was made by him and through him. So everything in heaven, everything on earth, visible or invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, everything created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Again, every single thing in creation is, is, the, is, the, is what's being talked about here. And then it talks about uh, he's the head of the body of the church, the beginning, firstborn for the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In everything in creation he might be preeminent. That's the, that's, the, that's the scope of this discussion. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And that's one of the proof texts for the divinity of Yeshua is that all of the fullness, again, we've been talking about all of creation made through him, all of uh, things hold in him hold together. He's the firstborn over all creation and all, again the idea is, all of the fullness of God dwelt in him. And this is, you know, I, I must say that when I'm looking now at this kind of passage, it does seem to me that Paul believed that Yeshua was more than just a man. He was something more than that. Not, that, not necessarily that he was you know, God in the sense of uh, one over three or anything like that, but he certainly thought he was something more than just a normal man. Um, and then again, verse 20, and this is the key one. For in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, and through him, that's Yeshua, to reconcile to himself all things. Now, to reconcile means to make peace. And when you look at the, the use of that word reconcile in, in, in other uh, scriptures, writings from Paul, that's exactly what it means, is that God making peace with somebody. And what's being made peace with here? With all things, everything, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So the idea is here, it seems to be clearly, really, the idea here from Paul is that it's it's like a sort of a majestic uh, survey of of the the preeminence the magnificence of Yeshua the Mashiach and the fact that through him God has reconciled to himself everything and that's the point everything has been reconciled so if if God has reconciled to himself everything then that must mean that ultimately everything is going to be saved everything has salvation now that's not uh, you know in this video i'm not going to focus on the point the point of well what about what about the existence of, of of some sort of hell what about the existence of some sort of punishment that is definitely there in paul's writings and elsewhere but the point is that ultimately everybody is going to be everybody has been reconciled to god Another place where Paul kind of makes this point is, I mean, there's a few places. I think 2 Corinthians 5 might be the, 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 the most logical next place to go. Um, yeah, here we go. Nice, helpful heading here. Obviously, these headings aren't in the originals, but um, nice heading here in the English Standard Version. The Ministry of Reconciliation. And I'll, re I'll read it uh, again at length. It says, therefore, know, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what are we, what we are is known to God, and I hope is, is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance uh, and not about what is in the heart. Uh, let me scroll down, actually, because uh, I don't want to read too much of this. Okay, yeah, here we go. Um, therefore, if anyone is in Mashiach, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There's that word again, reconciliation. That is, Christ 
that, sorry, that is, in Christ, in Mashiach, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trans- trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I'll stop there. Again, the idea here that Christ, that God was in Mashiach reconciling the world to himself. Again, not just reconciling believers to himself, but reconciling the whole world. Again, remember what was what Paul wrote in the Colossians letter, that all things, God re- reconciled all things to himself. And here we have that God reconciled the world to him. Now, another, another important passage is Romans 5. And very very similar message now here here um paul uh, brings in this motif which is very you will know this if you've ever, if you've been in christian churches you will know this motif of adam and yeshua now adam is the first adam yeshua is the second adam the last adam so what happened in adam according to uh, the theology or the worldview of paul and what happened in mashiach are kind of mirror images of each other in some sense. So let's read Romans 5 verse 12 onwards. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted when there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, verse 15. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Yeshua Mashiach, abounded for many. And this is where it gets interesting, or even more interesting. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification for if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Yeshua HaMashiach therefore now this is the key one it's all about the all again paralleling Adam and uh, Yeshua Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as the one, as by the one man's disobedience, the many, i.e. all, mentioned in the previous line, were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And so on and so on. And... Again, so as I said, we've got the added um, idea here of of Adam and and Yeshua paralleling each other. Through Adam came death. Death spread to all men because all sinned. Through Yeshua, Mashiach, came righteousness for all men. As in one, as, as one man, one trespass led to condemnation for all men, verse 18. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men for as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous the many being the all men previously mentioned it seems clear now when if you're a christian and you're used to these kind of verses you're used to limiting the the scope as as is the case with the colossians you know all all yes all of the fullness all things made through him but when it says uh, god reconciling all things to himself it's like no no no, that doesn't mean all things that means uh, just the believers or he has reconciled everything to himself but some of those things are still going to perish and burn in hell forever and ever for some reason because they don't believe basically likewise with second corinthians when it talks about how uh, the ministry of reconciliation and so on and then when it says uh when it says where is it yeah, when it says that in Christ God was reconciling himself, the world to himself, not counting their trans- trespasses against them, you'll be used to saying, oh, yeah, but that's only as in, you know, from that mo- moment onwards, you know, as a result of the, the you know, Mashiach's uh, death on the cross, salvation is available 
but not everyone is going to uh, be saved because God will hold their trespasses against them, <laughs> you know. Whereas Paul's not saying that. Paul's just saying, no, God was reconciling the world to himself. And then we get to the Romans 5, as in Adam. Where are we? I, I, I mean, I've said, I won't, I'll read it again, you know. The free, as, as through one man's uh, disobedience, uh, judgment came to all men. One man's trespass, death, through, death reigned through that one man. One trespass led to condemnation, condemnation for all men, i.e. Adam's tr trespass. So one act of righteousness, Yeshua's act of righteousness, reads, leads to justification and life for all men. Paul's, make, Paul's scope is everybody, but the theological, theologically accurate or you know, acceptable way of saying it is that, no, it doesn't mean all men. It means all men who believe only. And, you know, let me be honest verse 19 does say oh where is it is it this one there is a sense in which believers will experience that uh, that righteousness in this life by holding fast to the you know walking in the spirit walking in truth and so forth but the point is as i'll talk about maybe in other videos is that after a period of correct correction even the unbelievers even the worst of unbelievers will experience that chastening and that punishment in what we understand to be hell but it's not an eternal thing and then eventually they too will be will experience and live and reign in in in, in, a, in a future time and that really comes comes clear through clear and uh, crystal clear in first corinthians 15 which is all about the resurrection and you know paul's talking about all of the all of these writings are paul of course and um He's basically talking about resurrection and making the point that resurrection definitely is a thing and, you know, rebuking the idea that there is no resurrection. Uh, and then I'll read it from verse, maybe we'll go, uh, verse 15, sorry, chapter 15, verse 20 of First Corinthians. It says, but in fact, Mashiach has been raised from the dead. The first fruits, we saw the first fruits, that word in um, Colossians as well, the idea that Mashiach is the first fruits. In fact, Mashiach has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, or Mashiach, shall all be made alive. <laughs> Again, it's that all, all, it's that motif of Adam and Christ. The scope of Adam's headship, if you like, was all die, all condemned. And the scope of Mashiach's headship, head, uh, leadership, if you like, is that all shall be made alive. And we're paralleling that with all of his other writings. All, all have been reconciled to God. All have been declared righteous. You know, and then I mean, this is interesting. I'll talk about this. I want to talk about resurrection. I'm fascinated by the whole eschatology. Has always been a fascination of me. You'll see it in my previous videos as well. The whole focus on the end times. I, I love it. But but it says all as in Adam all die. So also in Christ Mashiach all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Mashiach the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be, dis to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things, this is a quote from the, Torah, the Tanakh, God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in sub sub subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, i.e. Mashiach, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. I'm going to stop there. And let's just tra trace through this again. What I was used to do, when it says, um, you know, all in Adam, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. I was used to saying, okay, every single person died in Adam, but but those who believe in Christ are the ones who shall be made alive. Whereas that, that sentence, especially when you compare it with all the other sentences, it makes it clear that the same all are, are being talked about here. But Paul, 
Paul then talks about the order of the resurrections. And he says, Christ is the first fruits, obviously. Then at, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, and i.e. saying that those who have believed on Mashiach in their lives, when Mashiach returns to set up his reign on earth, those who, his believers will be resurrected and will will rule and reign with him. I am, I was previously a pre-millennialist. I probably basically still am, you know, although I don't know, a lot of my beliefs are kind of, you know, touch and go at the moment with a lot of this stuff. But um, right now, this is this is how I am. And so it's making the point that then comes the end. Basically, what's going to happen is Mashiach is going to have to reign. Uh, and this is in keeping with, with all of the uh, messianic prophecies of, of, of the previous Tanakh, the Torah, the, the um, Nev, Nabi'im, Nabi'im, is it? The, the prophets and the, the writings. He's got, a, he's got a reign until he puts all things under his feet. So there's going to be a period of time where Yeshua is going to reign on earth. And then, and then at the end, once all things have been put under his feet, as it says here, Mashiach, there's going to be a period where Mashiach will actually himself sub be subject to God. And and this is a this is an interesting one for, for, for those who might say, well, no, when it says all shall be... Um, put in subjection under his feet that means that he's going to crush all of his enemies and they're going to go to hell but that doesn't make sense because it says then in the next sentence that the Mashiach himself will be made subject to God well what is he going to be thrown in hell no that doesn't make sense in the in the stream of thought that Paul was giving here clearly for me anyway it's evident that what he's saying here is that eventually Mashiach will, will subject himself be subjected to to God and all of creation, as we've seen in all the other scriptures before, or everybody else at some point in that period of time there is, you know, the, the rest of creation who have died will be resurrected and they shall be, uh, they shall receive, you know, they'll re receive the condemnation like Paul talks about it elsewhere. Is it Paul that talks about it elsewhere? Resurrection of condemnation, resurrection of righteousness or something like that. But ultimately, those who have been resurrected will be made alive, and they will live, and they shall live uh, in. They shall be reconciled. They will be reconciled to God. They shall be reconciled to God, and they shall be saved ultimately. So these are for me really clear passages that show that Paul certainly believed that um, all people will be saved. And those are the clear ones. There are some other scriptures which people point to in support of universal reconciliation which to me aren't probably as clear but I think when you interpret them in light of those other clear passages I can see why people use them so for example 1 Timothy 4.10 it talks about how how the living God is the saviour of all people especially those who believe well that makes sense with the other passages doesn't it all people he's the saviour of all people but especially those who believe who are believing because those who are believing will join in in the resurrection the first resurrection when when Mashiach comes back and will reign with him and also they will in this life now they shall they shall live an abundant life you know the fruits of the spirit and so forth and so on so in that sense they have that kind of extra portion but ultimately everyone has been saved because it says you know he's the savior of all people so I mean there's other there's other places I can go to but I'm going to stop there as I said in my opinion Paul the Apostle, the Paul of Tarsus, for whatever flaws he might have had, he clearly was, was at odds with James and the Jerusalem church and the, the, the Hebrew believers of Mashiach uh, based, in, based in Israel, based in, you know, in, in Jerusalem. He was clearly at odds with them. They had real difficulties, real disagreements about keeping Torah and so forth. But for whatever whatever faults he might have had with regard to his views of, of women and this, that and the other, he seemed to ha believe that Yeshua Mashiach died for every single person, reconciled every single thing in creation to God. All will be made righteous. All will be, as in Adam, all die as uh, in Mashiach. All shall be made alive and all shall be resurrected and will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll live. So... Yeah, that's my thoughts on the whole re universal reconciliation. For me, and I will talk about this in other places, but for me, um, it's a clear th thrust in Paul's writings. And for me, this gospel, the idea that everyone ultimately will be saved, is a very powerful gospel. It's much more powerful, much more uplifting, much more 
amazing grace than the traditional one the traditional gospel of you know god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son but only those who believe in the only begotten son will, will live the rest will be burnt will be thrown and burned in hell forever and ever and ever it's a lot more amazing than that gospel and it kind of helps me to understand why when you do read through paul's writings he was absolutely sold out for the good news he was absolutely um he gave his everything for this good news. He was completely convinced. And I can understand why. I can see why. Because this is a much more powerful uh, good news to me than, than the other versions of it. But anyway, as I say, I'm uh, my, the, name of the, the name of this channel currently is African Theist. I believe in God. I think there is much truth in the, in the Bible. I believe there's much to be learned from in the Bible. I believe there's... I do believe that Mashiach was was someone special. I do believe that he, uh, you know, I, I believe in him, basically. The only thing is, uh, you know, the doctrines that come with supposedly being a Christian, I, I, I don't necessarily kind of hold to all of those doctrines. But anyway, let me not long out this video. It'd be interesting if anyone watches this far, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this whole uh, subject. Take care and I will see you soon.